I'm the vice chair of the Peterborough Dems, um, and I'm here to introduce a presidential candidate. Again, remember the Peterborough, the Peterborough Dems cannot endorse, but um, we are happy, We're really happy to have John Delaney in town. I remember the first time I heard about John Delaney and his presidential campaign. It was mid-November 2017, um, and I was feeling really sad and hopeless. Um, things were really tough um, for me personally. My family and I were embroiled in having a very beloved family member be involved in what seems to be the ever-expanding Me Too movement. She'd been victimized terribly and had been put out in the public against her will. And um, so I was really stressed out and I decided to go up to an NHDP dinner. Um, and a speaker got up, and it was this guy, John Delaney. And everybody was sort of bumming at that event, feeling depressed about the current administration. And I just left that event feeling very hopeful. I felt hopeful about a few things. I felt hopeful that there was somebody who was already ready to take this on, who was already to jump into the fight. Um, and when we were still so far off, I felt hopeful that there was someone who didn't just get up and talk about himself, but who talked about policy and some of the changes that they wanted to make and the protections that he wanted to put in place to, from the stuff that had been going on in this current administration. So I don't really remember a lot about the details of the policies. I just remember really leaving that event feeling hopeful for the first time since, I don't know, maybe when I saw the Women's March after the inauguration. That was the first time I felt hopeful. So I've heard him several times since then. During the midterms, he came to our office with our big blue wave painting and gave us a really great pep talk on a day where we needed it. And he went out and knocked on doors with our now Senator, Gene Beach. Um, and for me, he's been a very visible candidate, somebody who I'm aware of. I hope after today, he'll be more visible to all of you and you'll be able to engage with him today and you will walk away today better knowing another candidate in this race. Um, so some of the things I know are true about John is that he believes health care is a human right. He takes LGBTQ issues very, very seriously, including wanting to create a federal ban on gay conversion therapy. Um, he has some really interesting ideas to modernize and update our education system. Um, he has some great things to say about um, embracing technology in our economy better um, and, um, and taking on the ramifications of a more tech-savvy and tech-reliant society. He has some really interesting economic policy to go with that. Um, and he's also very committed to bipartisanship. Um, and for all of us to look around at each other and see more than our political affiliations. Um, so I'm going to give up the microphone to John, but fun fact, John has attended over 30 Bruce Springsteen concerts in his lifetime. <laughs> well, we'll have to fix that. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all for coming out here. It's great to be with you. It's great to have this opportunity to uh, chat about the future of our country, because that's really what we do every four years, and you have a front row seat in one of the most important jobs in the country, to try to figure out actually why people are running for president, because that's actually the most important reason. And then what are they gonna do? But there is reason to be hopeful, right? There's reason to be optimistic. And you don't have to look further than the 2018 elections which were obviously terrific here in New Hampshire in many ways, but they were actually terrific around the country. And not just because the Democratic Party took back control of the House of Representatives, although that was a really big deal. But what you should really focus on if you want to be hopeful is how many people turned out not only to vote, but to run for office. The quality of the candidates, of the human beings that stepped forward to seek elected office in our country in 2018 was extraordinary. And I always say the American people always snap back when we're confronted with a big challenge. And I think the evidence that we are in fact snapping back 
is found simply by looking at the quality of the individuals who actually step forward to run for office in 2018. Right? That's the reason we should all be optimistic. Because that shows you that people feel an obligation to step forward and serve. And I think everyone in this country has an obligation to do something. That doesn't mean any, everyone's got to run for office, even though it feels like everyone's running for the presidency this time. But seriously, everyone has an, opportunity, has an obligation to do something in their lives to improve and restore our democracy. Because there's nothing more important and it is, in fact, worth fighting for every day of our lives. And so I appreciate the fact that you all do what you do and engage with the Democratic Party and with politics in general and with democracy in general, and it's really terrific. So one of the first things that happens when you decide to run for president is about 50 people call you up and, and say, when's your book coming out? So if any of you ever decide to run for president, you're going to realize you're going to have to write a book. So I wrote a book, and we have copies of it for everyone here, I think, and it's called The Right Answer. And it comes from a speech that John F. Kennedy gave in 1958. He was a senator at the time. And I found a line in this speech. It was delivered in Baltimore, Maryland. And I live in Maryland. And he said, we should not seek the Republican answer. We should not seek the Democratic answer. We should seek the right answer. We shouldn't seek to fix blame for the problems of the past. We should own our responsibility as Americans for our future. And he gave this speech four weeks after Sputnik was launched. You remember Sputnik, right? The rocket that was sent into space by the Soviet Union. In 1958, the American people were closer to World War II than we are to 9-11. They had saved the world. They had defeated fascism. They felt invincible. With one rocket into space, they were questioning everything. They were terrified. They thought they had lost their future. But great leaders like John Kennedy stepped forward and said, no, our future is ours to build together as Americans. Right? He reminded the American people that this notion of common purpose, that we're all in this together, is central to who we are as Americans. And he ushered in a wave of change. And I think we're at a similar moment right now. There's not one rocket into space. But there's a convergence of all kinds of powerful forces in the world, largely based on technological innovation and global interconnections. Things that have been extraordinarily powerful, right, and, and extraordinarily positive for so many people. But they've left huge parts of our country behind, right? They're changing our economy, they're changing the future of work, they're changing our security risks, they're changing how we interact with each other, they're changing how we get our news and information. And they're changing the world. And we have to respond to them. We have to respond to them. You know, the young people today are the first generation of Americans that will not do better than their parents. So every generation of Americans since this country's founding did better than their parents. If you were born in 1950 in the United States of America, the chances of you earning more money than your parents were 90%. Fast forward to 1980, it was 50%. 2010, it's estimated to be one in five, 20%. So in one generation, we've watched the American dream, this notion that you, know, you work hard, you play by the rules, and you live in a society that supports you, we've watched that kind of disappear right in front of our eyes. Why did this happen? Because the world changed, and we didn't do anything about it. We just watched it happen. Your federal government was absent. It was on the sidelines. It failed to do its most basic responsibility, which is to improve public education, improve our health care system, change our tax policy, think differently about environmental protections and consumer protections. It fundamentally failed to do the basic things it should have done to prepare our citizens and our country for that change. And listen, this is personal to me because I've lived the American dream. I was born in a blue-collar family in New Jersey. My dad was an electrician, neither of my parents went to college. My grandparents were immigrants. But my dad was in a union, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Any IBW folks in here? It's a great union, took good care of us. When I went to college at Columbia University, it paid for half of my tuition, which has always been a great reminder to me that no one does it alone in this world. 
right? I would have never had the opportunities I had in my life, but for the fact that some electricians threw money into a hat every week to create a scholarship, to give someone an opportunity that none of them had. None of them had. After college, I went to law school, where the best thing that ever happened to me, I met my wife, who's from Idaho, her dad's a potato farmer. So at Georgetown Law School, the electrician's son meets the Idaho potato farmer's daughter. We stayed in the Maryland area. I have four daughters. My wife is one of the leading experts on dealing with media literacy and children in the country. She helped found an organization called Common Sense Media. And I became an entrepreneur. I started a business about a year out of law school. I was good at it. I took it public. I was the youngest CEO in the history of the New York Stock Exchange. Ran my companies, created thousands of jobs. Was very proud of what I did in the private sector. But about 10 years ago, April and I decided to dedicate the rest of our lives to public service. That led me to run for Congress in 2012, and I flipped a district that had been held by a Republican for 20 years, turned it blue, and I had the privilege of representing that district in the Congress since 2012. So I have lived the American dream. I believe in the life that I've lived. You work hard, you play by the rules, but you live in a society where there's a certain amount of societal infrastructure that supports you in pursuing those dreams. And that's what we've lost. When you talk to young people in this country, and I've done 400 events around the country, and whenever I'm with young people, I hear the same thing. They're very anxious about their future. And with good reason. They're worried about, will they have good jobs? And they're right to worry about that. By 2030, people think 50 million jobs in this country are going to be replaced or fundamentally changed because of technology. They worry about the air they breathe. Will the environment be sustainable? Will the debts we're leaving them, will be, they be able to repay them? They worry about what's going on in our politics. Will every political disagreement be met by almost a violent protest in the future? Right, that's the world we're leaving them. But I think there's something so much better to leave them. Right, this is a miraculous, magnificent country. It has every advantage any country could possibly want to have in 2019. But what we don't have is a political system where our elected officials actually do their jobs and get real things done for the American people. Right? Real things done that matter in their lives, whether it be improving the public education system. Right? The K through 12 system was a marvel when it was created in 1892 by a group of progressives who were thinking about the next century and how do you educate kids to be prepared for the world that was coming. We all know that if we were actually thinking about the next several decades and preparing kids for that world, that they would all start at pre-K. Because it's the best investment we make. That if they're low income, they'd have some access to zero to three education. Because low income kids start kindergarten having heard one third of the words as other kids and they never catch up. We all know that when they graduate from high school, young people would have some opportunity to either get career and technical training or to go to community college. Because last year, according to the U.S. military, 71% of our high school graduates were not eligible for the military because of academic, social, or healthcare deficiencies. So obviously our kids need something after high school to prepare them for the world. If we we're thinking about the future, we would have been confronting climate change a decade ago, right? If we don't get to net zero emissions by 2050, right, we've got a huge problem. And the only way to change this, in my opinion, is to do what I've led it in the Congress on, which is to create a bipartisan carbon tax. That's right, bipartisan. I, I actually got Republicans to sign on to a carbon tax. I can get it passed in my first year as president. I'll do it with every Democrat and all the Republicans who live in coastal states, because they have to respond to this. Right? It was modeled to cut emissions by 90%. We put a tax on carbon, and we take all the money, and we give it back to the American people in a dividend. Fundamentally changes behavior. I've called for a five-fold increase in the Department of Energy research budget. Because if we're going to get to net zero, we actually need new innovation in battery technology and transmission technologies. I've called for creating a market for something called negative emissions technologies. These are machines that exist that actually can take carbon out of the atmosphere 
The problem is they're not of scale yet. And we need to put resources behind them and create a market so they can actually get to scale like what we did with wind and solar. We can solve this problem, but we have to get on with it. Right? If we were thinking about the future, we would change our tax policy. Right? Last year in this country, 80% of the venture capital, you know the smart money that goes into all the new hot businesses? 80% of that money went to 50 counties in this country. There are almost 3,100 counties in the United States of America. 50 of them, 1.6%, got 80% of all the startup capital. Talk about concentration of economic opportunity. Yet at the same time, 80% of our kids live in a county where the jobs that are getting created are not as good as the jobs that used to exist. Right? We would make fundamental changes to our tax code to encourage people to invest in communities that are left behind. Because if you're a young person and you're, you're born in one of these counties, you don't have much of a shot. These are the things that an enlightened society would do if it was actually thinking about the future, if it was trying to leave the world better than it found it. Again, we can solve every one of these problems, but we have to do it together. We need a president that has to remind the American people that we're all in this together and every one of us has some responsibility and obligation to do something in our lives to start healing this nation. I believe the central question facing this country is how do we take this deeply divided nation where American is increasingly pitted against American, where we have a president who wakes up every day and literally, I think, tries to figure out how to divide this country. How to tell the American people that your enemy is your fellow American, particularly if they have a different skin color or they worship a different God. But I think a president should actually have the complete opposite approach. I think a president should actually take an oath never to divide the American people. They should spend some time every day, whether it's quiet time or whatever it is, to try to get the strength to lead as a unifier. When I'm sworn in as president, I want to look out at the American people and say, I represent every one of you whether you voted for me or not. And to prove it to you, this is what I'm gonna focus on in my first 100 days. You know, the first three months that set the whole tone of the presidency. It's gonna be five or six existing proposals in the Congress of the United States that are bipartisan, like my carbon tax bill, or like my proposal on a bipartisan basis to invest a trillion dollars in our infrastructure, right? Or a really smart proposal to fix the Affordable Care Act while we get on to universal health care. Or a really smart proposal that exists in the Congress right now to create federal digital privacy regulation. These are big things where the American people, Democrats and Republicans in Congress have found common ground. Wouldn't it be amazing if a president said, I'm gonna start leading this country by having a conversation about some of the things we agree with each other on and getting them done to make a difference in your lives to prove the, to you that it's not just about us, the politicians, fighting with each other. It's about serving and being in service to you, the American people. That doesn't mean we want to live in a country where we agree with each other on everything. We definitely don't want to live in that country. But you deserve to live in a country where the disagreements are handled in an honest, truthful, respectful, and civil manner and where your elected officials spend some time rolling up their sleeves, finding common ground, and getting real things done that matter in your lives. Politics is not about entertainment. It's about affecting human beings and giving them opportunities. And that's what I'm gonna to restore to the presidency. I've called for the president to debate the Congress once a quarter, literally to go to the floor of the House of Representatives every three months for three hours and have a debate in front of the American people about the most important issues of the day. Because you deserve the truth. And we all know the truth is the truth, but it's become elusive in our politics. It's hard to find. How do we solve that problem? By getting out in the open and talking to each other. And I'm gonna call for national service. Create a new exciting program where every young person graduated from high school will have an opportunity to serve their country. Not a requirement, but a really exciting incentive-based program where they can either join the military or do community service or become part of a whole new infrastructure program to rebuild our national parks. 
Every single person in this country would benefit from this. The young people, they get mixed with kids from all over the country, from all kinds of different backgrounds. They get skills they need to prepare them for the future. And all of us would look at them and we'd be proud that we did that. We'd be proud that we actually made an affirmative step to start bringing this country together. So this is why I'm running for president. I want to be the person that can bring this terribly divided nation back together. To actually start getting real things done that matter to you, your children, your grandchildren, and to rethink our future together. Because I believe there's a much better future we can have. Every single issue we confront is solvable. And we'll talk about it. There's a way to create universal health care and pay for it. There's a way to deal with climate change without completely disrupting our economy. There's a way of creating a future where 80% of the startup capital doesn't go to 50 counties, but 1,500 counties. There's a way of fixing our broken criminal justice system and our broken immigration system. There's a way of thinking differently about foreign policy so the American people are safe and we're not engaged in wars everywhere. There's a better way on all of these issues. <clears throat> but it goes back to President Kennedy's quote. We gotta change how we think about things. It's not the Democratic answer, it's not the Republican answer, it's the right answer. It's the best ideas. It's not about what happened in the past. It actually doesn't matter. All that matters is what we do as Americans to build our future. And we need leaders who are committed to that, leaders who are committed to restoring a sense of common purpose to who we are as a nation, leaders who the American people look at and be comfortable that they have a sense of decency about them, and that they're actually serving for the right reason. And that, my friends, is why I'm running for president. So thank you for having me, and I'd love to answer your questions. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, there we go. Kath Allen, National Committee Preserves Social Security and Medicare. Two-part question. Even when we get the COLA E, it's not going to take care of the problem of so many people not having made a livable wage. What do you see as a way to fix Social Security without making it an entitlement, right. a welfare system, to somehow boost up with an average of only a little over 17000 a year for a Social Security check to help all those people who've worked so hard all their lives. Right. And the other piece is we were at a No Labels event. Yes. And uh, my takeaway from that was in the process of trying to make things work out, they weren't really securing Social Security. So I'm glad you're, you're so focused on Social Security because it's an important issue. The good news about Social Security is that among all of our issues, it's the easiest to fix. If we had a whiteboard, I believe everyone in this room could fix this problem in five minutes. And the reason I know that is because we've done it in the past. We've always made adjustments to Social Security. Social Security is in fact a social insurance program, as you said, it is not an entitlement program. People have paid into it. In fact, since the inception of the program, people have actually paid more in than has been taken out. So if you think about it like a ledger, more has gone in than has been taken out. So people tell you it's bankrupt, they're just lying to you. Now, in truth, starting very soon, more will come out every year than gets paid in. And by 2031, more will have gotten paid out than will have been paid in. And then by law, we have to cut benefits by 25%, which would be an immoral thing to do. So the point is we need to adjust Social Security now. We don't need to, quote, fix it, because it's actually not broken. We just need to adjust it. And we've done it before. The last time we did it very successfully was in 1980, where Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan agreed to, to adjust it. And this is how they did it. They said, we're going to get 13 people who really understand how this works. And we're going to make them a commission. And their job is to come back with an adjustment to Social Security that extends its solvency for 50 years and doesn't hurt the program. And whatever they come back with, we, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, we're going to make the Congress vote on it. They won't be able to amend it. They just have to vote on whatever they came up with. They'll have debates and all that stuff, but they have to give it an up or down vote. And this commission did this. They came back with a recommendation, Congress voted on it, and it passed. They extended the solvency of Social Security for 50 years, 
And back then, the poverty rate of our seniors was 20%, and now it's 10%. So obviously, you can adjust Social Security without hurting the program. So I've called for the exact same thing. It's the only bipartisan proposal in the Congress, and I led it. And I'm going to do it in my first year. And we will extend the solvency of Social Security. We're probably going to have to raise the cap to do it, make a few other adjustments, but we can fix it easy. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I'd like to know um, what, what you'd like to do about uh, the U.S. military budget, which I think is way out of proportion with the rest of the budget. And, and specifically, what would we do about the threat of nuclear war, which we're increasing by improving the nuclear weapons that we own? Uh, do you have a plan for that? I looked in your book and you mentioned nuclear three times. And that, that sounded like a rather uh, platitudinous way of dealing with it. But I think it's important that you talk about it. Sure. Well, it's the number one risk. Nuclear weapons are the number one risk facing the American people in the short term. Right? The threat of someone getting their hands on a nuclear and using it anywhere in the world is a massive threat to the American people. So as president, I commit to lead the world in continued discussions around denuclearization. Right? We're going the opposite way right now. The president just pulled out of an intermediate nuclear treaty. But I think if the President of the United States should do what other presidents have done, which is to continue to work with our allies by putting in place treaties to reduce the nuclear stockpile. And I'm absolutely committed to doing that. Great. Now, as it relates to the military, you know, the issue with our military is we never have a debate about what they do. Let me give you an example. Four weeks after 9-11, we entered into what was called an authorization for military force, which is a law that Congress passed to authorize the president to fight al-Qaeda or any subsidiary of al-Qaeda. It was done four weeks after 9-11, after that horrific attack on our homeland that we had to respond to. But that authorization for military force was open-ended, meaning it had no term, and it had no geographic limitations. Three presidents have now used it, Bush, Obama, and Trump. We have fought in three continents and 14 countries for 18 years. Not a single person thought when that was being entered into that that would be where we would be 18 years later. So I have been one of the loudest voices in the Congress calling for a new authorization for military force. The American people deserve a debate on the mission of the U.S. military. The amazing men and women who serve our country deserve a debate on the mission, right? Because so many Americans, this is kind of out of sight, out of mind. If they don't have a service, or someone serving who's a family member or a close friend in their community, Right? So we need, and what I would do is have a new authorization for military force with a new debate around the mission. It would have a five-year term, so you'd have to come back and get it reauthorized, and it would have geographic limitations. Because we can't really talk about military spending until we actually talk about the mission of the military. But what we definitely have to do is reorient a lot of our spending towards the, the risks of the future, which are cyber, right, and electromagnetic related. Because Russia and China have watched us in the Middle East, and they're like, we're not going to deal with them on that level. We're going to work on the next generation of weapons. So we need definitely a reorientation towards that type of warfare, because that's the risk to the American people in the future. Yes, ma'am. Hi there. Uh, Hi. Hoya Saxa to begin All with. All right. So double Saxa, semi Saxa. <laughs> Uh, I'm a physician. My husband is a physician. Speak into the microphone, please. I don't know. Speak into the microphone. Move it to your mouth. I, okay. There you go. That's, uh, we're both physicians. Uh, I feel strongly in universal health care, which is not something that physicians usually say. Uh, we have a direct threat right now with the Trump administration wanting to completely overturn the ACA. Yep. Um, I'd like you to drill down a little bit on how we accomplish this in terms of saving the ACA or what will happen if this is overturned, you become president, how do we get there, especially if there is a Republican Senate that's right. going to try and block everything? <clears throat> well, the Republican Senate is a problem, right, yeah. because we know what Mitch McConnell did. So we got to try to win the Congress as part of winning the presidency in 2020. So let me tell you what I would do. The first thing I would do is fix the Affordable Care Act, because I thought it was a great law. It wasn't perfect, but it was a great step forward. Medicaid expansion was really successful. Protections on pre-existing conditions and those kind of things really successful, you know, the minimum standards. But what wasn't successful was the exchanges. And the reason they weren't successful is because they were subscale and if you had some very high risk 
uh, members in those exchanges, if you will, then they kind of messed up the exchanges. They forced the insurance companies to increase prices. Young people bailed because it was cheaper to pay the fee, and they all went upside down. So the way you got to fix them is you got to create a way to get high risk patients out of the exchanges. And there's a bunch of bipartisan proposals in the Congress will do that. But that's a temporary fix. That I think you can do in the first 100 days if you get the right Congress. And that's what I'm going to do in the first 100 days. But then I want to lead the discussion, the, the country, in a discussion about creating universal health care, where everyone gets health care as a right. I think it's a basic human right. I mean, you're a physician, so you can appreciate this even more than I can. We clearly spend enough money. We spend $9,000 a person in this country on health care, right? The, the rest of the developed world spends 5000 So we're clearly spending enough money. And it's also smart economic policy. You know, when I started my first business, which ended up creating thousands of jobs, the only reason I was able to do it is because my wife worked at a company that had health care. But for her job, I couldn't have started my company. And that's like a lot of Americans. They're shackled to their job because of health care. And that's really stupid economic policy. You want everyone basically striving to do whatever they think is best for them career-wise, start a business, whatever the case may be. So we got to get universal health care. Let me tell you how I would do it. I'd leave Medicare alone because it works and people like it and we shouldn't mess with it. Then I would create a new program that you get from when you're born to when you're 65. And I'd roll Medicaid into that. So that would be your basic government plan, and the minimum standards would be consistent with the ACA minimum standards. So you'd have health care from when you're born to the end of your life, right? With this new plan to 65, then Medicare above that. But what I would allow people to do is buy supplementals, like they do with Medicare, because that's a really good model. And it's really a good model for the United States of America. And you know why? Because we Americans like choices. We are a choice-driven society. And if we become the party that you get no choice in health care other than this government plan, we will never win an election. And there's no reason to do that. You all probably like Medicare. In Medicare, you have all these choices. So that should be the way we think about the whole thing. So you have basic government plan. You could buy a supplemental. right? And I would pay for that whole system by taking away the corporate deductibility of health care. Right, because you don't really need it anymore. Because you'd show up at your company, you'd have your basic government health care. Right, and then what your employer could do, and I suspect most of them would do, is they'd go and they would negotiate like a group supplemental plan using their buying power. And then you as the employee can purchase the supplemental, but it's a relatively small amount of money because you have your basic government plan, which is kind of like your major medical. And that creates a backstop government health care plan for every American so they have it as a right. So if you're between jobs or you're low income or you want to start a business or whatever the case may be, right, you have health care. If you're a small business, you don't have to offer health care because every one of your employees has it. You can negotiate supplementals if you want, but you don't have to be in the health care business. Right? And that's a, that creates health care for everyone. It's fully paid for. See, now all the other Democrats are saying they got health care plans, and everyone's like, well, you have no way idea to pay for it. I just told you exactly how I'd pay for it. Penny, it actually matches. $4 trillion is what the corporate tax deduction costs us, and $1 trillion is the uh, Affordable Care Act subsidies, which you won't need anymore. And the cost of the universal expansion I just said is $5 trillion. Fully paid for. And it gives Americans choices. That's the universal health care plan I'm behind. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Matt Conant, uh, I'm an ad your transcript. Uh, just was wondering, you've been to New Hampshire a lot. What, uh, what have you identified as the biggest issues facing New Hampshire specifically? I would say uh, health care is a big issue, right? Because I, I have a sense your Medicaid system isn't particularly good. So it comes up a lot. I don't know if you'd all agree with me on that. We agree. <laughs> just saying. Um, and I think climate. I think climate's a big issue for folks in New Hampshire. I mean, look, your economy has done pretty well relative to other places, in part because of, you know, you've got a lot of good things going on in terms of quality of your workforce. You know, you're in a good market. You're reasonably well located near Boston, which has been a very successful city. So I think everyone's economy can always be better. I think yours has done pretty good. I mean, my sense of public school funding is a challenge here because of the way you fund things here. Big or the problem. way you don't fund things here. You don't have any income tax, right, which I get. You're not going to have one. 
So it's always going to put a huge amount of stress on local communities to fund public education. And I think that's a challenge. But those are the things I'm hearing when I'm in things like this for folks in New Hampshire. Immigration comes up a lot, you know, which we can always talk about. But yes, sir, and then ma'am over there. Pete Von Snyder from Temple, New Hampshire. We're here kicking tires. We like your tire. Um, the next election, the most important it took me a while to catch that there. <laughs> the next election, 2020, is most important to me that we put a Democrat in the White House. Yep. If we keep all our voters from the last presidential election and pick up maybe a half a point or one point from the other side and prevent the hard progressive, and I don't know if that's the correct term or not, from bolting the party. Yep. How do we do that? How do we keep the people that are that are on our edges uh, from staying home or, or voting for some third party thing? <laughs> Well, listen, the third party stuff, I mean, we just got to remind people what happened, right? But in terms of capturing the center, which I think we need to do to win, I think we got to put up the right candidate, right? I, I'm a more moderate centrist Democrat. I'm not afraid to say that. I think all the things I'm fighting for are progressive, dealing with climate change, creating universal health care. The difference is I've actually thought through ways of actually making it happen, and I think ways that make sense. And I tend to be more honest about the problems and the solutions. If you look at what happened in the midterms, the best lesson for us to win 2020 is to look at 2018. In every congressional district in this country, all 435 of them, we, the Democrats, had record turnout. Whether we had a young person or an old person running, we had record turnout. Whether we had a socialist or a blue dog running, we had record turnout. Whether we had a white person or a person of color, we had record turnout. So what does that mean? President Trump is pretty good at turning out Democrats. <laughs> Wasn't in 20, it, uh, but I believe that. I believe whether it's me or the other 17 or 50 or 500 people I'm running against, I think we'll all have really good turnout because you guys are gonna work really hard and the Democratic Party is really focused on being Trump. But you know what the problem is, he's gonna have really good turnout too because his voters are very passionate. So the 2020 election is gonna be fought in the center with that percentage of the population, which by the way is the fastest growing affiliation in this country, which is independent or non-party. You know that here in New Hampshire, because you got a lot of them. Some of you may be independents. That's where this election is gonna be fought. And if we make this election about a whole new economic model for the United States of America, that doesn't feel like a very good proposition for us. But if we make this election about putting up someone who is decent, honest, has solutions and wants to bring the country together and get real things done that matter to people, that feels pretty good to me. That feels like we're going to win that center and then we're going to win 2020. And guess what? I think we'll win everything. But if we make this about like throwing out the whole model of the country, and I got to say, after this Mueller thing, I think the stakes just got higher. Right? We have a reasonably good economy. And we, this Mueller report, which should absolutely be made public, absolutely. But let's face it, the headline of the Mueller report is going to ensure that he's running as a Republican. And so we got to play this smart, which is why I think I'm the best person to beat him in 2020. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, it seems. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it seems to me uh, a lot of young Democrats are turning more towards socialism now because capitalism doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be working for to, for fewer and fewer people. Yes. And other than providing better uh, educational opportunities and economic opportunities, do you see any way to structurally change capitalism the way it is working in this country? Yes. That's kind of a broad question. No, it's the right okay. question. Because in some ways this is a really silly debate and we shouldn't let ourselves have it, in my opinion. Because in truth, you know what the United States of America is? We are a free market country with strong social programs. That's what we are, right? Capitalism, socialism, we're a free market country with strong social programs. And I actually think the genius of our country historically, not in recent years, but historically, was that we allowed capitalism to do its magic, which is to create jobs and innovate like no other system in the world. And it created unmatched prosperity for this country, and it funded extraordinary programs, lifted huge people out of poverty, saved the world, all this kind of stuff. 
but we moderated it. Yes, moderated it with societal infrastructure, regulations, tax policy, and workers' rights. And it was in the balancing of those two things that we actually created the greatest economy in the world. But starting about 20, 30 years ago, we stopped doing the second half, meaning we stopped updating the social compact. Right? We didn't adjust our tax policy. Right. So look, at technology companies right now can move their, their intellectual property overseas, sell it all around the world, and pay no tax. That's because they're using an outdated tax code. It wasn't designed for them. Simple example, right? What I talked about with pre-K, things like that. So we have, what, where the Democratic Party should be is we should be doing what we've always done in this country, which is to take affirmative steps to make capitalism more just and inclusive so that it serves the common good. The reason we have capitalism in this country is not for the benefit of a small number of people. The reason we have capitalism in this country is to benefit the whole country that we think it's the right model, but it needs to be moderated and channeled with social programs. And that's what I'm running on. And that's what I think the Democratic Party should run on. And that's a message that wins you the 2020 election. Throwing the whole system out is not going to win you the 2020 election. That's just my opinion. Who was next? I think that won't be a woman. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Priscilla Starrett. I'm a retiring college professor. And I want to thank you for your concept of a national youth service organization. Yep. Because I think we really need something that young people can get excited about so that they're not uh, sucked into extremist ideologies on the internet. Right. Um, I've got two concerns I'd like you to share your thoughts with about. Um, a lot of the shops locally have help wanted signs yeah. in the window. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on an immigration policy that would work. And also, do you have any ideas about um, solving the very long-standing Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Sure. Well, those are two meaningful <laughs> questions. Let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> so it's the second part of your question made, is the only thing that could make me say the first part is easy. <laughs> so immigration. So I'm in favor. And I will make it one of the items of my first 100-day agenda of putting back on the floor of the Congress the bipartisan immigration reform bill that should have passed in 2013. It passed the Senate. About 16 Republicans voted for it. So it was really bipartisan. It would have passed the House. I was serving in the House. It would have passed. And Obama would have signed it into law. Huge missed opportunity. It was the ultimate deal. It had everything in there. It had border security. It had a pathway to citizenship for the 11 million undocumented folks in our country. It was long. They had to wait 13 years. They couldn't commit a crime. You know, they had to learn English. And it reformed our visa programs. That's what I favor. And listen, I've got, this is, again, a lot like most issues, it's personal to everyone. I mean, my story, like so many, is the story of immigrants. I mean. One of my grandfathers came into this country in 1923 as a little boy. I'm three quarters Irish, one quarter English. This is my English grandfather. So he came, comes in from England with his seven brothers and sisters and his mother. Goes into, goes into uh, Ellis Island. They all get let in except him. He gets detained and sent to Staten Island for deportation. And he's a little boy, 10 or 11. And the reason that he, they detained him and they were going to deport him is because he had one arm, right? And we didn't let people with disabilities into this country. It's hard to imagine, right? So his family got him an appeal a few months later. He's in the Great Hall of Ellis Island waiting for his appeal. Hundreds of people there. He's in the back of the room. He's a little boy scared. And the judge walks in. And my grandfather sees that the judge also has one arm. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason he gets let in. The judge looked at him and said, I'm going to let you in. Make something of yourself. So a little bit of shared humanity. I was just down at the border. My wife and I were down in Dilly, Texas, which is right on the border. We went to a detention facility where there were 1,700 women and children. And the reason we went there is she just stepped down as the chair of the Georgetown Law School Board. And we took 14 law students down there and two law professors for a week to help asylum seekers make their case. And I can tell you, when you sit and listen to these women and the stories of why they're fleeing Central America, Every single person in this room would do the same thing. So we need a little bit of shared humanity. 
But we also need to fix our broken immigration system, and that's what I think. Now, as it relates to the Israel-Palestine situation, I think, like most administrations, I believe we should have a two-state solution. I think that's ultimately the right answer for all parties involved, including Israel. Because if we don't have a two-state solution, it ultimately becomes a one-state country, and it's not a Jewish state anymore. So I favor, strongly favor, a two-state solution. I do think the two parties have to basically, at some level, figure that out themselves, because we can't tell them what it is. But we have to be a strong force in encouraging that outcome. So, you know, as you probably know, it's, a, it's one of the most difficult issues to try to resolve in the world. And I think the U.S. has, the US has to be a steadfast supporter of making sure we get a two-state solution, because that's ultimately good for all parties. The problem is politics gets in the way, both here and over there. And that makes it really tough. Yes, sir. Given the state of uh, economic inequality in this country and the fact that it seems to be increasing this based on our current tax code, yep. uh, what changes would you make to the tax code? So the big change I would make to the tax code that gets right at this issue is I would get rid of the difference between capital gains rates and ordinary income rates. Now maybe not for everything. There's certain types of behavior you want to encourage with a better capital gains rate. But the fact that we have a low capital gains rate is an outdated concept. It comes from a time, in many ways, post-Great Depression, where Americans were stuffing cash in their mattresses, and they weren't investing. They were scared. And so we created a preferential rate to get them to invest. That's not the world today. The markets are as liquid as they've ever been. It's never been easier to raise capital in the world than it is right now. We do not need the investor class paying half in their tax rate to the working people, because that's really what it does. We act like investors are these endangered species, that we have to protect them and give them special deals. I got nothing against them, nothing at all. But I don't think they should pay half the tax rate as the folks working in this bagel shop. So what I would do is get rid of that differential. Because the problem we have right now is there's a huge concentration of wealth in this country. And there's reasons why it happened. Most of it related to change. Whenever there's periods of dramatic change, you see concentration of wealth because a relatively small number of people with the right set of skills can really take advantage of change. And that's happened always across history. And then it starts leveling out if you get your tax policy and your social programs right. Because you start investing in people, they start doing better. And that's what really we have to do. But we also can't let this highly concentrated wealth compound at a lower tax rate than people's earnings, which is effectively what we're doing because that will exacerbate the problem. So that's what I would do, and it actually raises much more money than any of this other stuff people are talking about. People love to talk about high marginal rates. Guess what? Wealthy people don't pay. They don't make their money through salary. Athletes do and movie stars do, but the real wealth in this country makes their money through investing. So you can raise that marginal rate as high as you want. It doesn't actually cause them to pay any more tax. What I'm talking about does, it's not as, quote, headline-ish, but it's actually substantively much more direct to problem. Yes, ma'am. Then I think this. Then we'll go to you. Sorry. I apologize. All right. Hi, Susan Ladmer from Peterborough. Hello, Susan. Uh, there's been a bill going around Congress gaining some momentum to expand Social Security, basically to uh, raise the minimum Social Security rate to the uh, federal poverty rate plus 25%. Yeah. What do you think about this bill? So I think so. we do need to make adjustments to Social Security. Like, I don't know the specific bill in question, because there's always a lot of bills on Social Security. right? It's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bills. It's a big program, and people like it. So people are always doing things to make it seem better, because it's really good politics. So I'm not saying that's not a good idea. I'm saying I, I talked about how I would address Social Security, which is actually create a commission to strengthen the program and extended solvency. And I think ideas like that would actually be part of that discussion. Because we have a real issue, at, you know, in many ways with women who are living much, women are living much longer than men. And a lot of women are running out of their savings later in life. So, you know, things like having an additional supplemental program that kicks in when people are like over 85 or 90 is another thing that we probably need. So there's a bunch of things we need to tweak. Yes, ma'am. 
So I'm just concerned about the national debt. As you should be. And um, Dita English from Hudsonville. So I am concerned about the national debt. And when we hear about all these programs, which are wonderful, and I know the programs that you've addressed not only with us, but in your book, seem to have a way to pay for themselves. Yeah, everything I've proposed, you know, I pay for. You always you suggest and you show a way to yeah. pay for it. However, we have a lot of programs in place and more being suggested and the national debt just going up and up and up. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to reverse this trend? And how are we going to pay off that debt as we have done with other Democratic presidents? Yeah. yeah. So it's a great question. I mean, and it has been a bipartisan failure. And so you need to elect a president who cares about it, and I do. And it's funny, when I wrote my book, I laid out all the things I did, and then in the last chapter, I told my team, I said, I'm gonna write, tell people I'm gonna pay for all this stuff. They're like, well, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> because everyone's gonna like your first 10 chapters, then you're, they're gonna hate your last chapter. But that's kind of the problem with the country right now. It's easy to promise ice cream every day. So, we gotta agree on the right goal. So the right goal, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter how big the debt is. What matters is how big the debt is as a percentage of our economy. So historically, our debt as a percentage of our economy has safely bounced around, call it 60%. And what that means is, you know, that gets to really how much you can afford. It's kind of like your personal debt as a percentage of your income, right? It can be too high or it can kind of be just right. 60% is probably just right. Right now, it's trending towards 100%. Right, our deficits every year are about 4%. And the way this is supposed to work, when the economy is good, the deficits are supposed to be low. And when the economy is bad, the deficits are supposed to be high. That's like how it always worked. Now the economy is pretty good and the deficits are really high, which shows how bad things are. Because one day the economy is not gonna be so good. And then the deficits are gonna be higher. And then people are gonna get scared and interest rates are gonna go up. And then we have a a calamity, which is gonna happen unless we change things. I don't know when, but it will happen. So what we need is the right goal. So my goal, which I talked about in the book, is deficits of 2%. What that means is the country loses 2% every year. And some people say, well, that doesn't sound very good. Well, if the economy grows 2.5% to 3% a year, which is what I believe it can do under my administration or what we've historically done, then what happens is your economy grows faster than your debt, and the debt as a percentage of your economy starts going down. And then we're fine. And I believe I can do that by doing two things. One, fixing health care. The only number that matters in our spending is health care. Because it's growing at twice the rate of inflation. So every other item, discretionary spending, defense spending, Whatever the case may be, those things are growing much closer to inflation, and healthcare is growing twice the inflation. So it is gobbling up everything else. So you have to fix healthcare. And the only way to actually fix healthcare is with a universal system, in my opinion. Because we actually have universal healthcare now, which is the dumbest kind. Because if you go in the emergency room, you're guaranteed by law to get care. And that's a stupid form of universal healthcare. But the other thing we need is we need some more revenues. Right now, tax revenues are 17% of our economy. They need to be 19. Historically, they've been 19 to 20. We got to get them back to 19. We got to get health care under control. And then we can have deficits of 2%, and then we'll be fine. And then my kids and my grandkids will be able to sleep at night. Because what happens is, if you have a debt crisis, what really that means is interest rates go up. And if interest rates were at the level they were during Bill Clinton's presidency, which most people view as a pretty benign time, right? Our interest expense is a percentage of our budget, which right now is called 7-8%, would be like 16%. So where does that come from? So you're right to be concerned about it. But I have a plan. We have time for one more time. Okay, let's get these, we'll try quickly. I'll try to get three in real quick. Yeah, uh, you, your your policies have some your policies have some meat on the bones. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your policies have some meat on the bones yeah. in your centrist. So why in a crowded field haven't you gotten a lift? And also the second part of that is, um, you know, what's your lane to victory? Because 
with Biden, you're in broad strokes, you're going to be occupying the same right. general lane as he is. Yeah. So listen, I think the American people know Joe Biden really well. He has 100% name ID and everyone knows him. And I love Joe Biden. But I think you all have to decide whether you want him as the next president. It's almost like you don't compete with him. He kind of, people know him and they are going to decide that. My lane is to do well here and in Iowa. To have people like you all who have an incredibly important role to play in this country, which is to sit here in front of people and hear what they have to say, to make decisions that may not be the same as what the national media is deciding. Because their interest is in selling ads. Your interest is, is in picking the right person. So I'm, ba I'm banking on you guys saying I'm the right person for the job, popping me in some holes, and then I get plenty of national attention. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and then you. There are so many things I could ask. But Let's do quick questions because I want to get one more. I want to focus here. on one thing. Good. The Republicans are beginning to label uh, candidates again. Yeah. And the, the theme that I keep hearing is socialists. Yeah. They're socialists. How would you address that? How do you come back and see? What's your response? Well, first of all, I was the youngest CEO in the history of the New York Stock Exchange. I founded two companies from scratch and took them public before I was 40. And I was given the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award, which is what the big accounting firm gives to one person. So I think I got a resume to go into any single Republican in terms of my business credentials. And I would argue all day long that I was a better entrepreneur than they were. So they can't call me a socialist, right? I'll be swinging back hard on that. But I also believe that I was successful because I grew up at a time when society invested in me, which is why I care about social programs. So I, I, if that's the battle, I'm going to win that battle. <coughs> yes, sir. Yeah, my question is quite similar to the last two. Uh, the reason I, the, the reason I came here was I wanted a moderate candidate because I figured that's the only way we're going to win. The Democrats Got it. are going to win, and so I like what I've heard. Good. Uh, I don't know how you get your message out. Uh, but I will definitely vote for a moderate. Good. Because I don't want a I don't want an election that is going to be similar to like the '60s or '70s, uh, McCarthy, uh, uh, McCarthy, but McGovern and uh, you know, those those type. And I think if we elect somebody who's so far to the left, we're in trouble. We're in big trouble. So the way you, the way you guys can help me is someone's going to call you up and say, "Who are you going to vote for?" It's Golden Poll. And you, 31% of people are saying Joe Biden. He's got plenty of points. You can take a few away from him. And you can say John Delaney. Because Joe Biden's still going to be fine with 27 points. But John Delaney getting four or five puts me on the map. So that's how you could help him. <laughs> no, seriously. Thank you all very much. I'd love your support. Thank you. Thank you all. And before you get up, I actually want to tell you about a second way you can help our campaign. Right now, we're working to qualify for the presidential